Throughout the years, Frostburg School has made it possible for many people to enter the teaching profession who could not have done so. If it had been necessary for them to go to the University of Maryland or some other distant point. Of 215 students enrolled at the college, our survey shows that only 10 of them could have attended college at all, had it been necessary to go further from home. Western Maryland is better off than most other parts of the states and many parts of the United States because we have the Teachers College and democracy cannot hope to survive unless we have higher percentages of educated citizens. Lillian Compton, 1947. It was on the morning of September 15, 1902, when 57 eager and apprehensive students arose and got ready for the big day ahead of them, unsure of what events were to unfold. Entering this new and exciting establishment, this group of 16 and 17 year old boys and girls had the privilege of being some of the first to tour the new college. Viewing the building, they saw three large classrooms on each of the first two floors, a modern chemistry lab located in the basement, and a room positioned on the top floor that functioned as a gymnasium and auditorium. This group of young students all shared the same desire of attending the first class at State Normal School No. 2, a new college in Frostburg, Maryland, that offered a two-year degree of elementary school teaching training. The very foundation of the school emanates from the local miners' desire for better education in Western Maryland. Without the support and financial help from the miners, Frostburg State University would not exist today. The college has advanced from a small teacher's college to a well-known university. Through the various name changes and programs added, the college has always resembled the same thing. A community's aspiration for educating their youth and impacting the Frostburg community in a positive way. Looking at the progression of Frostburg, it is obvious that the college has introduced fascinating aspects to the town. The college has diversified Frostburg by drawing in many individuals from different countries in various regions of the United States. This has benefited the people in Frostburg in more ways than one. The students from Frostburg State University have assisted with bringing financial stability to different businesses, helped the townspeople learn about various cultures and countries, and have allowed people to form relationships with others from far off locations without ever leaving their hometown. The college itself has benefited the community economically by providing many jobs and infusing the local economy with money from students. The school is not an isolated facility. It is one with the community and has provided the city of Frostburg with an interesting history. What I can remember is that there were four very popular young professors whose contracts were not being renewed. And when that news leaked out to the students, um, it caused like meetings to be called in the dining hall. Um, there was a protest march down Main Street in Frostburg. Without the college, who knows what Frostburg would look like today? It would be an average declining Appalachian coal town with a much smaller population. In fact, the college students make Frostburg's population double in size. Frostburg State University has brought so many positive attributes to the town and all the credit is due to the miners and others who played important roles in founding the school. Through their persistence, dedication, and hard work, a college was built that changed the history of Frostburg forever. Due to the various programs being added and the school progressing, the name of the institution has changed three times from its beginning, from State Normal School No. 2 when it first opened, to State Teachers College at Frostburg, or Frostburg State Teachers College, in 1935, to Frostburg State College in 1963, and finally, to Frostburg State University in 1987. 
1931, the school went from a two-year school to a three-year school. It was then advanced to a four-year school in 1934. The school has made enormous advancements from 1898 to present day, when a small group of miners from Frostburg, Maryland, united to raise money and build a school to benefit future generations. They were unaware of the immense impact the college was to have on the trajectory of the Frostburg community and the evolution the college would go through from 1898 to 2016. Although the school opened in 1902, various efforts were put forth years before in order to build the college. The history of Frostburg State University dates back to 1897, when the Board of School Commissioners began discussing the building of another state normal school. But no serious actions were taken to further the idea. If it was not for the editor of the Frostburg Mining Journal, J. Benson Oder, Frostburg State University might not be in existence today. I think had we not had the Mining Journal, it could have gone to Cumberland, maybe even Oakland. Uh, Oder was just voracious in his support of getting the school here. On January 8, 1898, Oder made the crucial decision to suggest that State Normal School No. 2 be built in Frostburg in an open letter to his readers. Oder persuaded townspeople to take action and raise funds in order for this to happen. In response to Oder's letter, Frostburg's town father set up two local committees, with one on site and correspondence and the other on finance. Rector of the Episcopal Church, Reverend Mr. A.C. Haverstick, took the role as the general chairman. Once the news got out, the people of Cumberland were angry, arguing that Cumberland was the only logical site for the college. In 1898, an amendment to the Appropriations Bill actually said, here is the money, the 20000 to build the school. It was then referred to the Committee on Education. Determined to have the college built in Frostburg, a group of lobbyists traveled to Annapolis to urge that Frostburg be chosen as the site of the school. Fourteen men from Oakland also traveled to Annapolis, arguing that Oakland was the only reasonable location for the school. Oda responded to the claims of both Cumberland and Oakland by writing that Oakland was surrounded by hundreds of acres of Gladeland malaria and that building the school in Cumberland would be an invitation to the Grim Reaper. Well, he basically said that students would freeze up in Oakland and Cumberland was a swamp and they would get all sorts of diseases. But Frostburg had a good mild climate and a community that would support what was the normal school at that point. While the normal school question was still taking place, the Cumberland Evening Times ran articles about a suit against the paper mill and urged the citizens not to drink from the Potomac. Using this to his advantage, Oder insisted that Frostburg had clean water and a healthy climate. Through the controversy, the Frostburg community began to feel discouraged, realizing that the chances of the school being built in Frostburg were minimal. However, Cumberland eventually gave their efforts, and on February 24, 1898, John Leake changed the Frostburg history by proposing Bill No. 202 to Maryland General Assembly, which specified that State Normal School No. 2 be built in Frostburg. It actually went through two readings. In the third reading, it was evident it was not going to go anywhere. So the Western Maryland delegates had a meeting to decide what to do, how to approach the bill dying, if you will, and a way to get the school funded. The bill was introduced as a local bill without the support of the administration. Captain T.F. McCardell met with Senator Dick and delegates Campbell, Rowe, and Leake and suggested that when the general appropriations bill came up for a final vote, Leake should move an amendment. Everyone looked at John and as the junior member, 
decided he would come up with the amendment which was read when the appropriation bill for 1898 was being ready to pass. Since you have to have the appropriation bill, the amendment for state normal school number two passed as well. Captain McCardell got many important individuals from local counties, and on April 1st, the bill was passed by the House and sent to the Senate, where it was referred to the Committee on Finance. It was there that the bill died on April 4th, 1898. After this massive disappointment, the townspeople and mayor lost their excitement for the normal school idea. Doubt grew as many Frostburg locals realized that Frostburg had no land to deed to the state, no money was available for land, and the citizens began to think maybe Frostburg was not the best place for the school. However, many hopeful locals kept their spirits up. Reverend Haverstick suggested that the people contribute $500 to start a fund for purchasing land, but they were reluctant to contribute. The state was going to supply the money for a building which became Old Main, but the community had to get together and raise money to buy the land in which the college was founded. Good news reached Haverstick in August when he was told that Governor Lowndes would bring school board officials to Frostburg on August 17th to pick a site for the school to be built. Around 10 p.m., even more good news was brought to Haverstick when they notified him that they agreed on Bell's Park as the site. F.C. Bell, owner of the property, was reluctant to give it up. He named a price of $2,000. He was a dedicated community member, and even though he was not excited about giving up his property, he did not have any objections to its purchase. Bell's Park was a unique location because it separated the Caucasian and African American communities in Frostburg. The Frostburg community immediately got to work on raising funds for this land. Members of the committee went to the miners and asked the men for donations as they left work. The names of the groups and the amounts given were recorded in the mining journal. The Bicycle Club gave $65, the Mayor and Council gave $250, and there were many more individual contributors. The Coal Miners of Frostburg, one of the first groups to donate money, did so as they left their work. Their contributions are the reason Frostburg State University exists. Reverend Haverstick went to all the mines, or a majority of the mines, ask the miners for help, and they gave their nickels, dimes, quarters, maybe more. Miners who did not make very much money to begin with donated all they could to advance education in this small rural area of Western Maryland. More than 900 miners donated to the cause because they wanted a better life for their children and grandchildren. I'm saying our miners, those miners of Allegheny County, and that they realized the importance of an education. I also think it is safe to say that education was going to be able to get the children out of the mines, which were just a very hazardous job. Even though it was beneficial to the miners if their families joined them in the mines, due to the fact that men who brought their sons into the mines increased their wages by 50%, the miners wanted a much better life for their children. In October 2015, Robert Sparr, a 2013 Frostburg State University alumni, wrote an article detailing one local mining family's push to create Frostburg State University and the educational benefits that it created for future generations of that family. In 1871, nine-year-old Charles Hager began working with his father, John. Charles spent 10-hour shifts on his back, picking at coal above his head in crevices too small for adults. His wet clothes, which were blackened with coal dust, would freeze to his back on the long walk home in the winter. In November of 1877, Charles' father was trapped in the mine for three days and had his chest crushed by debris. Life in the mines was far from easy. Valuing education and understanding the dangers of this occupation, Charles Hager was one of the many donors to State Normal School No. 2. According to the obituaries of the Borden Mining Company, many miners died young due to mining accidents or illnesses obtained in the mines. 
A few examples are Lewis Thomas, who died on October 1, 1898, at the age of 27, due to three to four tons of roof collapsing on him. And 30-year-old Benjamin Thomas, who passed on June 19, 1897, due to apoplexy. These brave men risked their lives every day just going to work. Not only were they extremely hardworking, but they are the reason State Normal School No. 2 was built. But it was the only school which would have enabled everyone to go to school. The miners, again, just that importance of education, the realization that education can get you a better life, a better job. For the businessmen, hypothetically, they were already there and they just didn't see the need. They changed the community of Frostburg and all of its students' lives for the better. They are just a few examples of the 900 hard-working miners who gave money to benefit others and provide a better future for generations to come. Without the selfless act of giving by the miners, Frostburg State University would not exist today. Bell was paid and the deed was handed over. They then had to take it to the state. The bids were much too high to submit. On June 5, 1899, Muritans and Sons of Cumberland came to the rescue by submitting a bid around $21,000, as well as a bid for $3,000 for plumbing and heating. Things began to fall into place for the benefit of the Frostburg community. 1899 was the actual groundbreaking. They had to ask the legislature for more money. The building was finished, I believe, in 1900, but it was another two years, 1902, until the first class started. By the following January, it became obvious that the appropriated funds would not be enough to complete the building. Mr. Haverstick wrote to the state board and asked for help. The board suggested that the Allegheny County delegation should introduce another bill, but with the support of the board and appropriate $5,000 for completion of the building and another $5,000 to finish the school. Meanwhile, Cumberland was planning on building a high school, which deeply angered Odor. He claimed it would rival the normal school and keep Cumberland's potential teachers from coming to the normal school. Finally, the $15,000 that opened the school came from an omnibus bill that passed on March 5, 1902. As excitement filled the town, the locals were oblivious of the long and compelling journey that was ahead for the new college. The first graduating class of State Normal School No. 2 consisted of eight female students who received a diploma and teaching certificate on June 10, 1904. More students were drawn to the school and enrollment grew to 121 students after just seven years. With the enrollment growth and the need for an adequate teaching environment for students, the college added the model school in 1913, which was the first campus training school. The model school was an elementary school for Frostburg locals where state normal school number two students were able to display their skills as teachers. A year later, a new gymnasium was added to the school. Next, the first residence hall was opened in 1919. In 1931, the college went from a two-year school to a three-year school, and then to a four-year school in 1934. The name changed to State Teachers College at Frostburg in 1935. The college grew in enrollment steadily, but struggled during the Great Depression. Because of the Depression, the budget was cut by 58% from 1933 to 1935. So, the tuition and board and room prices saw a strong increase. Starting in 1943, a movement to close the institution had begun in the state legislature by the Marbury Commission a commission that studied and investigated the field of higher education in order to determine the best use of funds for higher education in Maryland. In response to this, on February 1, 1945, Lillian Compton became president and her mission was to prepare the college for its closing. With World War II taking place, many male students were being drafted and women had to get jobs. 
so, attending college was far from an option for most students. The enrollment dropped to 62 students and the college had inadequate funding and outdated facilities. However, the end of World War II brought great change. Enrollment increased to 274, mostly due to the GI Bill, a law that provided various benefits for returning World War II veterans. In fact, by 1947, half of college admissions in the nation were World War II veterans using the GI Bill, which provided up to $500 for higher education. With the help of State Superintendent of Schools, Thomas Poland, Jr., and Governor William Preston, Jr., the General Assembly was petitioned to keep the school open and the Marbury Commission's recommendations died. Enrollment increased from 62 in 1945 to 500 in 1954. The faculty also increased from 13 to 34 members and the campus expanded under Compton, increasing from 8 to 40 acres of land. Compton carried the college through its difficult times as president and showed Western Maryland that a woman can be an effective leader. In 1959, a new teacher training laboratory school was completed and named to honor State Superintendent of Schools Thomas G. Poland. It continued functioning as an elementary school until 1976. In 1961, Frostburg State Teachers College saw its first African-American graduate, Leon Brumbach. But then I got here and it was a different story. There was so much going on all the time that I was, and I was involved in a number of clubs and organizations and I played three sports. And of course, there was always something going on in the dorm. So it was just good times, all good times for me. Although Leon never experienced racism or discrimination at school, he did have an interesting experience while eating lunch in the community. A friend and I, went over town to the restaurant to get something to eat. And we went to Finzel's. And after we were seated in the booth, uh, the gentleman at the counter beckoned for Ronnie to come over to speak with him. So Ronnie went over and talked to him and he came back to the booth where I was sitting and he was laughing and smiling and I said, all right, what was that all about? And he said, well, he wanted to know what you were, meaning what color you were or what nationality you were. And I said, well, what did you tell him? He said, well, I just told him you were Portuguese. So that was the end of that. We just laughed and everything was fine from that point on. The school continued to prosper as new buildings and degrees were added and many new students were attracted to the institution. From 1964 to 1979, the college saw an immense amount of expansion and advancement including six residence halls, the Fine Arts Building, the Lane Center, Lewis J. Ort Library, the Chesapeake Dining Hall, Physical Education Center, Hitchens Administration Building, Frampton Hall, Dunkel Hall, and the Stengel Service Building. The Performing Arts Center was completed in 1994 and the Center for Environmental Sciences Appalachian Laboratory opened in 1999. In 1960, Frostburg State Teachers College added a Bachelor's of Arts degree and a Master of Education degree. Three years later, the name was changed to Frostburg State College due to the new degrees being added. In 1987, the college received university status and became known as Frostburg State University. As FSU, the university has made great academic advancements. The university offered its first doctoral degree in 2012. The doctorate degree offered is a Doctor of Education in Educational Leadership. Frostburg's president at the time, Jonathan Gibraltar, wanted to see the university grow into more than just a regional center. He wanted it to become um, a center that granted terminal degrees and became um, 
I guess, a bigger institution in the state. One of the first to graduate from the program was Dr. Stephanie Marchbank. I think daily life in the student, you know, as a doctoral program, you know, you're still having your, your workload um, with your full-time job and, and your family, but on top of that, I typically would, you know, get up, go to work, come home, you know, do homework with my kids, cook dinner, get them to bed, and then I'd stay up. Then, then I'd, I, it would be my me time. You know, my husband would leave me alone. He'd, he'd go watch TV in his man cave, and I would, you know, sit at the computer um, for hours writing, doing research or reading, you know, and um, I'd stay up until the wee hours of the morning. Each year, a new cohort of people seeking their doctoral degree is brought into Frostburg and then into Hagerstown at the University System of Maryland at Hagerstown the following year. The college has seen a great many changes and growth since its opening 114 years ago. Starting from a small state normal school with eight students, to a university with 5,756 undergraduate students. Frostburg State University has witnessed numerous events that have changed the university forever. From 2000 to 2016, Frostburg State University saw major renovations and expansion. In the fall of 2000, FSU's enrollment was around 4,000 students. And since that time, FSU has increased its enrollment by 20% to 5,756 undergraduate students. The school is known for its great diversity, and by the fall of 2015, FSU had a 42% minority undergraduate enrollment. In addition, the university has accomplished many great things and has been recognized with several awards like the LEED Gold Certification for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design for its Catherine R. Guerra Center for Communication and Information Technology. The award is a certification program that recognizes best-in-class building strategies and practices for energy-efficient buildings. The other single award that we received was in 2000 when the Corporation for National Service identified Frostburg State University as the first ever recipient of, the, of its award for community engagement. And, and that had to do a lot with our AmeriCorps program and the emphasis that the university places on community service. In 2001, the groundbreaking for Allegheny Business Center at FSU took place and Gunter Hall was renovated and reopened a year later. In 2003, the Compton Science Center and the Edgewood Commons apartment complex opened. Five years later, the FSU Research Center opened in ABC at FSU in 2008. When President Jonathan Gibalter came to Frostburg State University in 2006, it was a notorious party school. He witnessed how out of control the problem was and how it began to affect the local community in negative ways. In 2006, when, when Dr. Gibraltar came here, um, we, we had an incident off campus in early September that year where a student uh, I should say a former student, because that student was, was expelled, uh, assaulted a local community member who was walking down the sidewalk, and it seemed like to some kind of very horrific assault that caused pretty serious physical injury to that, to that gentleman. And um, um, I think the president just said, you know, enough is enough. This, this environment here is not conducive to living. It's not conducive to learning. And it's not who we want to be as a university in terms of being a good steward in the community. And so I think that he said at the time, you know, we get, we've got to do better. And he de really demanded that we, that we did a better job. Frostburg State University's health and alcohol prevention programs have been successful at addressing the alcohol issue. But deterrence is equally as important as the other two areas. And um, uh, Probably not everyone appreciates that either, um, but it's very important and has a significant impact that if you know that there's a specific outcome 
of you doing something you probably shouldn't be doing, you're less likely to do that behavior. And um, along with the deterrence piece comes a lot of information. Like we, we com consistently market and message to students saying, hey, think about this, and if you do this, by the way, we're gonna do this. So um, uh, just have, making sure students have that information in hand is, is pretty important. In September of 2008, the group CHILL, Creating Healthy, Informed, Lasting Lifestyles, was created. The group promotes health practices and education among FSU students and the local community. Also in 2008, the group began offering free biomedical screening for students. We would not have had the success that we've enjoyed without the active involvement of the greater community, both uh, law enforcement, city of Frostburg leaders, and um, efforts like the uh, community coalition have reinforced that we're all in this together. Created in 2011, the coalition's goals include minimizing the incidence of harm associated with youth access to alcohol and decreasing the binge drinking rate among FSU students by 10% as measured by the core survey in the spring semester of 2011. The coalition does not discourage drinking altogether, but makes it a point to focus on underage consumption and alcohol abuse. In 2012, FSU and the Frostburg City Police agreed to joint jurisdiction. It allowed campus police to patrol off of campus in search of parties and potential drinking. Also, it is probably the best example of an area in which we have partnered very deliberately with the city of Frostburg. As um, you may know, we now have joint jurisdiction of the student neighborhood so that our university police can assist the city of Frostburg police in responding to incidents that occur off campus. I would say without question that most of our high-risk drinking does occur off campus at uh, house parties that are uh, held in the, in the student neighborhood. Alongside joint patrols, the university gave more severe punishments to students, scheduled more Friday morning classes to persuade students to refrain from partying on Thursday nights, had alcohol-free activities such as crafts and karaoke on the weekends, required freshmen to pass an online alcohol course, and paid to train local bar employees to deal with students under the influence of alcohol. Frostburg was one of the first eight institutions in the country to require an online alcohol education program called Alcohol EDU that is administered to all of our uh, entering students, whether they be transfer students or uh, freshmen. And it is one of the few products out there that is been shown scientifically to have a, a great deal of efficacy. The university's approaches were extremely successful. Over the past decade, FSU students who said they binge drink dropped by a quarter and the average number of drinks consumed by students has been cut in half. The university has seen the addition of new buildings and the expansion of campus to Hagerstown. Many new degrees added, and great changes occur with the health and safety of students. The university continues to prosper and advance each year. The modern era at Frostburg State University has been one marked with innovative advances which have moved the university to fulfilling its role as a place for higher education in Frostburg. Old Main was located in Bells Park facing Lou Street, known today as College Avenue, and behind Old Main was Brownsville, a small community of African Americans that began in 1866. The community was named after Tamar Brown, one of its first occupants. Tamar Brown, or Tamer Brown, it's, it's actually pronounced in a number of different ways, and spelled a number of different ways, uh, was a 
freed slave. We believe she came here as part of, uh, part of Thomas Johnson's group of people. Tamar Brown, a freed slave, purchased lot number one with the purpose of building a school for African American children. Brown paid $250 in December of 1866 for the lot and began construction of a one-room schoolhouse almost immediately. The schoolhouse, which was later named Lincoln School, was opened where Gunter Hall is today. That first school was built in um, 1868. They uh, purchased the property for a dollar um, on July the 3rd of 1868 by the fall, and their school years were a little different than ours, it might have been November, there were already students going to school there. And it's exactly the same time that um, the Bell School starts. By 1870, almost 100 African Americans lived in one and a half dozen houses. And 50 years later, the community was home to 250 African Americans. Most of the men in Brownsville were stable hands, coal miners, or laborers, and many women were washers or scrubwomen. The people who lived there largely were involved in menial positions. Uh, women, a lot of them worked as, as laundresses, a lot of washerwomen. Men typically worked in carpentry. They also worked as carters, which would be people who took care of horses and carts and so forth, and we see some miners too. Needing a place of worship, the community built John Wesley Church on the site that is now Lowndes Hall. However, the state began purchasing Brownsville homes for only $10 per home for the expansion of the college in the late 1920s. The people of Brownsville had no choice but to move out of their community and were displaced into other communities. This devastated many families financially and disrupted the life they had made for themselves. Some people moved in with family on Mechanic Street. Um, and of course, you know, those houses had to be built. Uh, so, you know, they had to wait a while. They had to, you know, get money together and so forth. Um, and, you know, people helped other people. Allegheny Hall and a new laboratory replaced homes east of campus. After World War II, the expansion of Frost Hall, construction of Lowndes Hall, and athletic fields overtook more homes. Lincoln School and many homes along Park Avenue were destroyed for Allen, Compton, and Simpson Halls by 1955. Now, when it happened in the 50s, um, it was, to a certain extent, much more difficult. And actually, the whole community looked at that. It started in, um, I want to say, 1951, and then, of course, continued into the 60s. And um, one of the things that was done was you know, they created the public housing. The late 50s saw the construction of a new Lincoln School and what is now the university's public safety office. However, the school was only open for two years before Brown v. Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, and the integration of Allegheny County Schools. Eventually, the small community was gone and Brownsville community members were forced to relocate to other parts of Frostburg or out of the area completely. And the tight-knit community was dismantled for education. At that point in the 1950s, a number of people left. You see a lot of people moved to Rochester, uh, where um, you know, we had traditionally a group of people that were connected to uh, the people in Allegheny County. Um, you also had people who moved to, I want to say it's Brooklyn, I think that's right where you had another group of people who were uh, you know, connected by blood and by tradition to Allegheny County. Although expansion of the university was necessary, the methods used to obtain land from the citizens of Brownsville was less than ethical. Frostburg State University brings many jobs to the local community. 
there are 977 employees at FSU, which has a substantial impact on the local economy. The roughly 1,000 employees that we have uh, at the university, many of them live and, and work in, in Frostburg and the surrounding area. The population of Frostburg in the year 1990 was 8,069 people. The population in 2010 reached 9,002, an 11.56 percent increase. Without the effect of the Frostburg State employees on the local economy, it would be another declining Appalachian coal community. Frostburg would be very different. I don't see our census saying 9,000 people. Um, I don't think we'd have half of that. At this point, being that it's one of the more major employers in Allegheny County, um, I don't see there'd be much need to have too many street lights, too many streets. So I think we'd be a totally different community. And where the people that remained here, where they would work, they'd probably be in a medical field, uh, they might be in the education field, but I kind of doubt there'd be a reason for this, this school being here at that point because there wouldn't be enough families living in Frostburg. In addition to the economy, the university also brings a diverse array of people to the area. They've obviously helped our full-time enrollment. I think they've impacted Frostburg in its giving those of us, students, community, faculty, staff, a way of learning about the other countries, the people in those countries, and realizing that we can't be just an island, we can't be alone. We need to learn about the diverse world around us. The students being here is a great way to get that started. According to the 2010 census, the city of Frostburg is more diverse than Allegheny County in almost every demographical category. The diverse population also means that 8% of all homes in Frostburg speak a language other than English. Statistics may attempt to quantify the effect the university has on the local economy and demographics, but the impact goes far beyond monetary means and numbers. The college has impacted the small community of Frostburg in great ways. FSU has created an increase in population, allowed new cultures to reach the area, diversified the town, and created almost 1,000 jobs for the people of Frostburg and the surrounding area. I think the biggest impact that Frostburg has on the community is to serve as an anchor institution for this region. And when I use the term anchor institution, I'm not just talking about its contribution to the economic development of the area, although that's huge. It's estimated that for Allegheny County alone, our impact economically is about $121 million and we, we generate over a thousand jobs in Allegheny County. But it's also a, a cultural uh, center for, for the university because of our events like the lectures that we have, the programs that we offer through our cultural events series, uh, and, and, and that kind of thing. And we certainly are also contributing to the well-being of the area through the volunteerism efforts of our students. We have students that are working um, to improve the literacy of, of area youth through programs like Read to Succeed. We have individuals working with the Animal Shelter, the Western Maryland Food Bank. So there's a lot of community outreach that is being performed, not just by our students, but also our faculty and staff. Frostburg State University has allowed Frostburg to prosper and accomplish many things that would have never been possible without the university. From its very inception, Frostburg State University has always resembled the miners' dedication to benefiting the community and providing better lives for young adults in Frostburg and the surrounding areas. In 1898, when miners donated their hard-earned money for higher education in Western Maryland, 
They changed thousands of lives in the history of Frostburg forever. The university has attracted students from far off locations and has diversified the small town of Frostburg. FSU has increased Frostburg's population and the students have helped small businesses thrive. The university has provided almost 1,000 jobs for the people of Western Maryland where good jobs are at a premium. They have created many health and alcohol prevention programs that have not only benefited the students of the university, but also the community of Frostburg by providing a safer environment for students. The university has paved the way for change in the community by having a female president, Lillian Compton, in 1945, and an African-American graduate in 1961. The town of Frostburg is much different than other towns in Allegheny County and the surrounding area, simply because of the university. Looking at the progression of the university, it would be impossible to overlook the miners. The coal miners of Frostburg are the impetus for Frostburg State University and the numerous benefits that have come with the university. The miners' aspiration for providing a better life for fellow community members is the reason thousands of students each year are granted a degree that will help them to become successful. Starting from a small building with eight students to a university on 260 acres with an enrollment of over 5,000, Frostburg State University truly started from nothing and progressed into a well-known Maryland University that has changed the lives of many. The contributions of miners started Frostburg State University on a path towards an educational institution that has provided numerous advancements to the Frostburg community and changed the history of this small Appalachian coal town forever.